Welcome to Speaking Candidly with Candace, where we will talk in depth with everyday people about their fears and challenges and how they have overcome them. I'm your host, Candace Schoner, and over the next half hour, I hope you'll be engaged, enlightened, and inspired to live your best life. Today, I will be talking to Dodie Greer. Dodie is a author and has suffered her entire life with depression. In her first book, Touch, she writes about a young woman who can't stand any type of physical contact. And she resigns herself to a lonely existence of servitude to her family and others. She recently published her third book, The Final in a Mystery Series, and blogs regularly about her personal struggles with depression, anxiety, fear of the dark, and loneliness. Dodie, welcome. Thank you for having me, Candy. I am so delighted that you are here. We first met and I heard about your book, Touch, which I'm going to just show the audience right now, Wonderful. which we will get into a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to know, first of all, um, you grew up in Whiteville, Virginia, is that With correct? Phil. With Phil. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I've never been there. Common mistake. Common <laughs> mistake. Okay. Well, glad to know that I'm common. Um, can you share with our listeners a little bit about your childhood there? Um, our Whitfield and Wythe County is a fabulous place in southwestern Virginia. Um, it's very rural. It's very close and tight-knit, so everybody kind of knows everybody else uh, around, around the town. Um, it, it's very much like a very large family. Uh, speaking about family, you are a your family dynamic is yourself and a brother, is that correct? I have my brother and my father is still alive. And your father is still alive. Mm -hmm. And you also were caring for your father, is that correct, at some point? That's true, yes. When my mother passed about uh, 12 years ago, I, I took over care of everyone in the family. Which is less the whole story about sort of caring for others and really giving up a lot of what you wanted to do, is that correct? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, when you dedicate yourself to putting others needs before your own that sort of takes a life of its own that's that's a full-time job on top of a full-time job because I was a teacher as well so um, yes we have a very large family um, a very large extended family and and we had grandparents and, and a lot of folks to take care of and when did you decide to be a teacher um, or when did you start teaching <laughs> well I I went to Virginia Intermont College and I majored in English and creative writing because I wanted to be a writer. Uh, but my family had pushed me from the time I was probably around five to be a teacher. That's a very noble profession in their minds and uh, of course it is in general. But um, So they had been pushing me my entire life and telling me I would be a teacher. So finally um, in my latter years of college I started working with an ESL program. Um, through college and I realized that that was a very interesting and fun job so when I got out of school I I got my teaching degree and I I started teaching middle school but you always had the bug to write is that true oh absolutely I've been writing since I was seven since you were seven do you remember your first story uh, I remember my first poem that was the first thing that I did I, I wrote a poem and um, I got into much trouble for writing that poem because my parents didn't believe that I could have written it myself. <laughs> your parents couldn't believe it? What about your teachers? <laughs> oh, my teachers were fine with it, but my, but my parents didn't believe that I could write it myself, and that gave me a, a, a definite seed of determination that there, this must be something that I could do to prove them proud. Can I ask what that poem was about? Um, it was about a house. I, re I recall it was, it was just about, um, we had to write about our, our family house or, or something of that nature and, and I had to do this big description of, of a house. It wasn't my house that I wrote about, but it was a house and it was rather good, I think. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> it was because, <laughs> I mean, you have turned into a, an excellent writer, at least in my opinion. Um, I mentioned the book early on, Touch, mm -hmm. which I'm going to show people so they can also see what it looks like and maybe buy a copy of it. It's a phenomenal story. Thank you. And what I want to know is, is it somewhat autobiographical? Absolutely, it is. Um, of course, it is a work of fiction, but the main character, Alex Sutton, is very much based on me personally at that time in my life. Um, and it is based on 
the family dynamic throughout the book. Um, the places are real, the characters are, names have been changed, but they are very much based in real people. Um, conversations in some parts are verbatim. So in the book, and we're talking about touch, the character, much like yourself, mm -hmm. doesn't like physical contact. Right. I can't even fathom what that would be like growing up and, and not wanting to be touched. I also read in the book, relatives came at your dad's funeral. He's obviously not passed, but mm -hmm. in the book, he does die, and you are constantly being hugged and mm -hmm. tugged on and touched. What, what is that like, and how did you overcome it? Because when you came in today, we hugged hello. The audio engineer put a microphone on you. You were fine. So how does one overcome that struggle? And how did that become to be a problem for you? Um, I think that I avoided touch basically from the time I was a, a very small child. It's all due to trauma. Um, but it is very difficult and lonely. Um, it's very secluded existence when you don't let anyone within your personal bubble. Um, and I had a, a much larger personal bubble. Um, even more difficult as a school teacher for middle school students who I constantly want that. to come and be in your personal space. And uh, my students learned very, very quickly that I was not appreciative of that. And, and they took it very well. Um, they're very intuitive about it. My family is extremely touchy-feely, as they say. And they, that was a really hard thing growing up because they always wanted to be touching. I have a million aunts and uncles and cousins and they're all about touch and hug and, and just touch you whenever you move and rub your back and I can't, uh, I couldn't handle that. So going back to the book, which uh -huh. we, you have admitted that this is autobiographical in some ways, um, the story of the character who mm -hmm. gets over being touched, can you share with us how you, your true story relates to the book or vice versa? Yes, so in the book um, there is a a character who's a doctor who just sort of walks through barriers and and hugs our main character whether she wants it or not it, it came at a very specific moment in time and for whatever reason that person just uh it felt okay it felt okay for that person they were very non-threatening i guess or whatever but it was okay so uh, that kind of opened a little bit of a world and that actually did happen personally to me there was one person who kind of walked through a barrier and was able to touch me and it made me think that if one person could touch me and I could be okay with it, maybe there were other people out there who I could be okay with touching me. And that's what led to uh, me really trying to start steps to overcome my issues. So did that mean that you were letting more people in that knew you and accepting touch? Or, I don't know, did you go to therapy? Uh, all, therapy. all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. I did start letting, I started forcing myself a little bit um, to be open to hugging family member or hugging uh, a stranger uh, who was just obviously, a, a, I, she hugged three other people. I'll let her hug me too. If they go for it and we'll do this. I started shaking hands more often. I, I started uh, reaching out and touching people <laughs> a little bit more and Yes, uh, therapy helped a lot. I have a wonderful therapist. Um, and just being making a real conscious effort to say, this makes me feel weird, strange, but it's kind of something that I want now to. And did getting, I guess, past that help you to become less lonely? Yes. Um, I, I feel like I can connect with people now. Um, it's it's just been a huge game changer in my life because now I can be more open and I can accept people into my life. And, and at what age did that sort of all happen and connect? 38. I'm wow. 41 now, by the way. 38. This has been a two-year two thing for me. Um, took two years to get over these, these things to the point where I have. So. Well, I mean, it's, it's got to be ingrained in you, oh. and especially from an early age, you know, mm -hmm. and then living your life that way. Mm -hmm. How did that work with your family dynamic? Oddly, I will have to say oddly, um, my parents were very affectionate with each other. They were very touchy. Uh, my brother is extremely hands-on and, and touchy. Um, and the fact that I could not 
ha have anything to do with that sort of set me apart all the time. Just set me apart I from everything. Mm -hmm. And then personal relationships. You can't have a relationship if you can't let people touch you. You, you just, it doesn't work. <laughs> you can have really nice friends, but they, have, friends, they but have to know they have personal. to stay on the other side of the table, you know, so you can't have a real personal relationship. So that also has been able to change in my life. And yeah. That makes things a lot less lonely. <laughs> I, it does. I see you smiling about right, that. Absolutely. So when did you have your first real relationship? Um, I, within the last two years, within wow. the last two years, as soon as I started making efforts to get over the touch, um, I, I found some folks who really wanted to help with that and, and made it a little easier for me. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I also want to know how it relates to your writing because you do a lot of blogging. You're very open mm -hmm. about your background and your personal struggles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was writing or is writing therapeutic for you? It is. It absolutely is. And it really helps um, in the processing of various things. You know, when you have a topic on your brain, you can, you can process by writing through it and just pouring your heart out on a piece of paper and that's okay. Um, I think in my blog, I tend to pour my heart out to anyone who wants to read it. So, <laughs> And I see you have quite a bit of followers. I'm going to just go back and look at my notes and be oh, very oh, okay. honest about this. Sure. You know, going back to te being a teacher in mm -hmm. middle school with mm -hmm. your students, um, did students ask you a lot of questions about it? Did you use that as a learning tool for them? Um, I absolutely encouraged all questions especially once i once i published touch um when when that came out and folks started reading it there were a lot of questions that came my way and they were typically prefaced with this might be embarrassing i don't know if i should ask you this so i just put it out there i said I, i'm an open book about this i'm an open book just ask me whatever question you have because i found that a lot of people they have their own stories and they right. they have their own issues and and they want a connection over that right. issue. And I've been trying to avoid the whole topic of, you mentioned early on about the trauma that sort of started this. True. Are you willing to share that? Um, and I don't want to go down the bad path. Right. But, but we do know your story has a happy ending. <laughs> yes, it, it does have a happy ending. Um, I think that there was just, um, there wasn't a lot of happy touch when I was very little. And when you are that small and every touch is a negative, mm -hmm. then that's what becomes ingrained in you. When right. you don't have grown-ups telling you touch is good and cuddles are good and, mm -hmm. and hugs are good, um, it feels very threatening and very overwhelming and that sort of becomes a monster in your own mind. Right. Monster in your own mind. You can tell she's a writer. That was well said. <laughs> um, and I imagine that also played a big part in your depression. Oh, absolutely. Um, of course, when you when you are that secluded, um, you, you're just disconnected. I mean, I'm pretty sure that I, my therapist would probably agree that I basically walked through my first 38 years disassociated completely with life. So I didn't even know that I was a robot zombie kind of stuck in my wow. own brain, just walking in this fog. Um, and a lot because I couldn't process touch. I couldn't, I couldn't think that anybody could ever be close enough to me to. Can you share like a, a typical day for you? What would have been when um, you were experiencing this? Um, I, would, I would get up, I would put my fake on. A lot fake of women, a lot of, put, a lot of women put their face on. I put my fake on and uh, went to school and I had my school persona. And so I was a teacher and the people at school just saw me in a certain light and uh, I was, I guess, maybe kind of normal, I hope. Um, <laughs> I can't guarantee that. But um, I, I did my work. I did what I needed to do. I took care of my kids. And then when I came home, it was duty filled with uh, taking care of dad and cooking and, and family members would constantly be coming by. And then I would go to my room and just sit. I would go into my own area. There was not a you know, there wasn't a lot of interaction in off time or on the weekend and just shut down. Shut down. So you didn't communicate by phone, didn't call out to people, didn't have many friends? I had a, I had a couple of good friends that I would text with when texting. Finally, I'd never used the phone. I hate to use the phone and talk act out loud, um, but I did kind of get into texting at some point. 
Um, no. Oh, I, I, wow. Hours could pass. I could just sit and stare out the window and hours could pass. Is that when you started to think about some of the books and writing and stories that you now publish? I like to... No. No. <laughs> no. Okay, was, Those are other stories. Those are other stories. Yeah. That was, I think, my mind's escape was in creating characters that could do interesting things and have interesting lives. I want to go back to touch the book. Sure. And talk about interesting lives. In the book, you have a very close friend that you uh, met in college. Yes, and Kason. she comes in and out of the book mm -hmm. to support you through uh, your father's funeral mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also when you the relationship between you and the doctor character change we'll say right I don't want to spoil the ending for no, any no, of the no spoilers. listening <laughs> but um, the end was interesting do you get a lot of questions about <laughs> the ending of the book um, my standard response I hope I can say this my standard response from 99% of people who read this book and then communicate with me is what the hell Straight up, what the hell? Because it is a change-up ending. It is a little bit of a surprise. It's not... Very much so. Yeah, and a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, you can't stop there. You, you can't stop there. What? What's next? What did this mean? What was this? Ah. What did this mean? We need more. Are you thinking about a, a sequel? I'm halfway through the sequel. You are halfway <laughs> through I'm the sequel. I'm working on the sequel. <laughs> I'm going to look forward to reading There that. will be more. There will be more. Um, talk about the mystery series. Uh, my mystery series is called Fair Warnings. Um, every one of my mysteries uh, takes place on a cruise ship called the Sweet Magnolia. It ports out of Charleston, South Carolina. And um, our super sleuth is the cruise director and her sidekick, the ship chef, who uh, every time they go out on a day trip, a, a weekend voyage, somebody gets killed and they are solving the mystery of who killed whoever died and and how that goes about and and it's a very as far as a murder mystery can go i think they're very light and they're very funny uh there's a lot of comic relief in in those so they're not gory they're not you know they're not going to be something that's going to weigh you down at night if you read them before bed so the first one was the voyage of the fatal fate i mean the voyage of the wayward wedding uh, the new one is Voyage of the Fatal Facelift, and the third one will be um, to come later, The Voyage of okay. something. Do you do a lot of research for your books? Have you been on cruises? I have. I've been, uh, I've been on many boats. I've been on many boats. I've been to Charleston a million times. Um, See, and I would think that would be a place. And when did you start doing the cruises and sort of doing the research for the book? Because... I've been on cruises and it's very hard not to be touched by people. Everything, everything in my life has only happened in the past two, two and a half years. Wow. Do you feel sort of like you may be being re, like I, a child reborn I am and starting a child. your life? I am a child. Half the time I am a toddler uh, just learning to, to touch things. I, I like to feel things. I like to find all kinds of tactile experiences. I, I love to go to a toy store and yeah. just touch things. <laughs> um, but yes, and all these new experiences, travel, I've just, I've turned into a little traveler. I enjoy travel everywhere. I, I, I love a good road trip, any good adventure. I'm a total adventure seeker now. See, and that's what I think is so inspiring about your story and your life is that it's a huge change and it's a huge opening the door for you and you are just getting out there and enjoying all these new experiences. Um, I think it's fabulous. This past summer, um, was the first time that I ever got into water. Oh my God. Like the, I got into the pool and enjoyed myself in the pool. I got into the ocean without shoes or socks on the beach. I got in, I got in the water in the ocean. I laid down in the middle of a, of a river in the rapids and just became one with the water. It was Amazing. fantastic because I've always been frightened of water as well. I have to say, share a little story about myself, which I didn't think I would do today, <laughs> but I know what it's like about something that you experience for the first time. I've had problems with my vision my entire life, mm -hmm. and I had LASIK surgery, and it was the first time I could go into the ocean 
and see without my glasses oh. and see what was on the floor of the ocean. It was incredible. I'll bet it was. Um, it was definitely a, a life-altering experience. Yes. And it sounds like you are experiencing many of those. Almost daily. Daily. <laughs> You know, and this, this is another thing, when you talk to your therapist or did you look online with the internet and see if there were other people that you could relate to and have a ser and had the similar experience of not liking to be touched. Because I've never personally met anybody that has admittedly said, I do not like to be touched. People come out of the woodworks. Um, my, my personal website, dodiegreer.com, uh, that's where my blog is. And I get people who message me through that website and uh, they'll find me on Facebook, they'll find me on social media, and they'll tell me their story. I have never wanted to be touched either, and this is, this is what happened to me. Or they'll say, I, I would really like you to, could you maybe message my nephew, who I feel is going through this, this same thing, like he won't let anybody touch him, or my niece wow. won't let anybody touch her. And, um, so yeah, a, a lot of people, a lot of people have come forward and and tried to contact me and make connections. Now, what about people in personal space? I think we all have sort of an area between two people when you meet that becomes your comfort personal space. Was yours very far apart? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, and even now, um, I will say that when I get triggered by by something. Um, I still have to, especially around doctors. Um, I recently had surgery and the doctor came into the room and I was just frantic and I was like, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to take like three steps back before I can talk to you. Wow. So I've at least learned how to say, I need more personal space instead of freaking out further. But um, yes, and that used to be a thing. I would have to take two steps back myself widen that gap. And then there's some people who don't respect that. They so you take two steps back and they take two steps I mean, forward. They usually you find take that? three steps three forward. Three steps forward. <laughs> so um, let's, let's talk about some of the triggers that might help other people as they listen to the podcast. Sure. Do you mind sharing some of your triggers? Well, um, for some reason, a, a lot of things happen around um, the medical profession for me. So anytime that I have uh, interactions, dentists have always been fine, but other than that, um, I think it's uh, the fact that doctors tend to put their hands on you, right. and they do that without asking permission first, and that always kind wow. of, and of course, uh, personal background, um, we didn't do, it was a religious thing, we didn't do medicine and stuff, so oh, really? we were always told that you know doctors were kind of an evil entity, so that kind of layered it on, but, um, for people who just come at you and it's their job and they don't think about just touching you because right. that's what they're supposed to do. And I guess you're supposed to anticipate that. Um, I couldn't anticipate that. I, 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 just, I couldn't stand for them to just suddenly there was all this touch. So what was, when did you first go to a doctor? Um, not until after I took my dad to a doctor, and that's where this book starts. <laughs> and that is where the, the book starts, because as soon as you said that, I had that moment of, I believe I read that chapter of your book. Right. Um, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yes. I mean, of course there were random little things, like you have to go and get a TB test before you can be a teacher. There were, right. there were little instances here and there but uh, that I suffered through, but um, not really until um, I took my dad and met this doctor. Well, and I know we talked about this before you came on the show, that you suffered with cancer. You've had some, some surgery recently. I did have and, surgery recently. And everything has come out clean. Everything's fine. How did you discover the cancer? Um, I kind of got goaded into going to the doctor for a totally unrelated cause and just the regular line of things. They so doing said, a regular physical, someone mm -hmm. suggested they, that it's time that, you know, you're getting older, you might need to have a head to toe checkup. Sort of, yeah. And, and, and then that's, and then they, they were like, it. oh, yeah. Like they had some questions about things and why certain things were happening in me and uh, that led to a, a test here and they were like, oh, you know, oh, okay, well then we need to have some more tests done to figure what this is. So. 
Wow, and that had to be kind of frightening, I would imagine. Yes, and now the friend who actually goaded me into going to that doctor, I'm not very happy with. I'm just kidding. I'm perfectly fine with them. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds like they saved your was, life. Yes, well, it was very traumatic. <laughs> but yes, yes. Well, I'm glad that you're, here, you're doing well. And I'm, I'm doing very well. Everything is good. That's, that's great. Um, I have so enjoyed having you be my first guest on our show. What and, an honor. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you sharing your story and your blog. Give us the website again and how people can follow you. Uh, DodieGreer.com. That's just my name, DodieGreer.com. And it's D-O-D-D-I-E. G-R-E-E-R.com. Mm -hmm. Easy enough. Right. And so what is the future hold for you? Well, that is a million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. If anybody has any ideas, please feel free to let me know. <laughs> um, but are you still teaching or did you no, no, give up I, your career in te as a I, teacher? I gave up my, my teaching career after 17 years. Um, I left everything in uh, with County and moved to the Charlottesville area just um, a year ago. I've been here now for a year. So um, very soon in my future, I intend to go hot air ballooning. I want to jump out of an airplane. Excellent. Um, I, I want to do a lot of traveling. I want to just meet a million new people. Uh, I, I, I want to do everything. And we can follow all the stories on your blog. You can. <laughs> you and can. hopefully there will be more books that you will be publishing. Yes, I am, I am working on the fourth one now, yes. And when can we expect the sequel to Touch to come out? Oh, I don't know. Um, I will say that Touch and its sequel, who a faithful reader wants me to call Feel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she really wants me to name it Feel. Um, they are, they are emo it doesn't make sense. They are very emotionally taxing mm -hmm. compared to a light, fun murder mystery right. that I get to have fun writing. Um, so it's taken me a little bit longer to write the Touch sequel so, but is, a it good years. Th is, it, is it good therapy though as well? Do you it, feel like, I mean, I know it it's is. hard and you're, you know. Again, it's a wonderful processing tool. Will the doctor character be in the next one? Um, she'll make a cameo. <laughs> yes, love that character, I'm just saying. If you love that character, um, that is Dr. Elizabeth uh, Reynolds in touch. And I loved that character so much myself and kept her in my head myself. So she is actually, Elizabeth Reynolds is the cruise director in the murder mysteries. Oh, so she is excellent. the main character. She's not a doctor in those two, but she is the main character in my murder mysteries as well. Yeah, any, I'm gonna ask, cause you know, Alex Sutton is you mm -hmm, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, names of characters. Last thing I want to ask is how do you came up with your names of your characters? Is there any story behind those? I kept it super close. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kaysen in this, her, my real friend is Casey. Uh, um, Beth Reynolds, the, the real person's name is, is Rebecca. And we call her Becky. So I was Beth wondering and that. Becky and Elizabeth is her middle name. So. <laughs> Well, feel free to use my name in a character. Of the course, book. Um, of course. It's, actually, all, it's all yours. Actually, you might uh, you might find something very close already in Ooh. one of the two murder mysteries. You should Ex check them out. <laughs> Excellent. I, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I can't thank you enough again. You Absolutely. have been wonderful. Thank you for speaking candidly with Candace. I want to thank my guest Dodie Greer for sharing her story and being so candid with you and myself. And thank you to my listeners for checking out this podcast, speaking candidly with Candace, and remember, every cloud has a silver lining.